We would issue this out as a technical guideline so that, again, if, if a developer was proposing a new street and it met these sort of criteria, then this would be something that they would have to look at. It also, again, provides the guidelines for us as we're, as we're doing reconstructions and looking at it. Any questions sort of about the, the guidelines, et cetera, that uh, we, that was been developed by staff and we're, we're, we're proposing to um, implement to, to, to work through these, work through those areas that may have this issue? Well, I would compliment you that you certainly went way beyond <laughs> solving the initial request. <laughs> I didn't really think we were setting a city standard, but well. I understand there's reason for it. So very good. I commend you for it. Let's, All right. Let's I'll do let's it and solve the problem great i will let staff know so we then took and applied oh, there's more, yeah, there's more. <laughs> where's more since you're since you're in, in, in concurrence I'm with the standard I complimented you <laughs> uh, no it's actually actually because what we then did because of course the question is what do we do in this particular area because that's what came to you uh, we uh, staff then applied um, the, the the criteria to both washington street and we also applied to the court street because we have had um, internally to staff, both through parking, through the police department, and through public works, complaints of similar conditions as what was being um, discussed about 191 Washington Street, where, again, parking was blocking things, making visibility, et cetera. So we did apply um, the standards to both streets to give you an idea of sort of what it would look like. So applying it to Washington Street, um, the areas that would have delineated parallel parking on the east side, it would be from Tyler Street up to Greenwood Street, excluding the area, the no parking zone in front of Franklin School. So this would basically go all the way up to just up to 191. So one in front of 191 would have delineations. On the west side, uh, we would start at 118 Washington Street, which is directly roughly across from Beaver Street. That's the cross street. And that would go up to High Street. Because if you, again, if you think about that space, that area there, you, you have a large number of mixed uses along there. And again, we've had some complaints um, from, from that side of the street and some of those um, businesses and residents about this sort of issue. Um, then, like I said, we applied it to Court Street. Um, looking at Court Street, we would go from Mechanic Street up to Union Street along the east side there and then on the west side we would go from summer street up to nine court street so that's a little bit shorter on the west side because once you get above nine court street the uh, it primarily becomes residential even though those are very large um, properties they do become primarily residential and again potentially down the line if those change out those are the types of um, properties that once they change out they do move to this sort of office mixed use use that it may be warranted in the future so what that what that means is there's that would mean about a, a delineation of approximately 110 parking spaces between both washington and court street um, based on our current contract uh, with our line painting, um, to do 110 spaces would be about $2,000 a year annually. Is that all? That is all, sir. <laughs> okay, very good. Court. Uh, committee question? Yeah, Bobby. Um, I guess my, my question is about uh, the one parking space that really super concerns me uh, along Washington Street where, where Beaver Street comes in and um, you know driving a small Hyundai if there's a if there's a big van over there there's no way to see um, the oncoming traffic and there's also a problem with vegetation in that area during certain months of the year um, would it be possible to to move the beginning of the parking spaces in that area you know a bit farther up the road we'll take a look at that again part of the delineation is uh, within the city on all city streets there's a 30 foot setback from the intersection so that will help hopefully mean that maybe though that, those, that particular situation, they may not be parking that far away from the intersection. So that may help that. Um, we can take a look at it after, after we do the delineation just, just to see that um, that's doing. And certainly on vegetation, if the vegetation is on private property, we can certainly notify the property owner that they need to do some trimming yes. uh, to create visibility. It's actually a city-owned rain garden, I believe, ah. uh, certain times of year. It gets a little high? Well, I, you know, I love seeing everything grow. <laughs> Green but, infrastructure. Um, so we'll take a look at that. it is much more difficult. Yeah, we'll, we'll take a look and see maybe yeah. if that, that needs to be kept down a little bit. Yeah. But we'll take a look at that situation after we get it delineated. Thank you. Okay, so it's $2,000. Per year. Okay, I need to find 2000 somewhere else in the budget because I will not be responsible for a budget increase. <laughs> Not your problem, but this is this is a good priority. Good, excuse me. Uh, any public questions, comments? 
Committee. Councillor Williams, how could you put forth? Move to recommend that the presented guide from the Public Works Department for the delineation of parallel parking stalls on public streets be accepted. Second. Okay, we have a motion that has been seconded. Anything further from the public committee? All in favor? Boom. Thank you. It's so good to be back again as, <laughs> as a working committee. It seems like it's been many. I'm always on. Now I can't see it. So, yeah, I, I have this special microphone. <laughs> so it's really good to be back all. Okay. Uh, next item, uh, we have a communication from Council Williams. Should I do it there? Any way you like. Okay. Well, <laughs> uh, no. I'm happy to do it from here, but no, do it. Do it there. Okay. The camera hopefully will follow you, or not, or whatever. And the, the communication is regarding um, uh, some littering on public streets. Thank you for bringing this forward. I also received the communication, which I responded to, but you have moved it into council. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I received a, Bobby Williams, a Ward, Ward 2 city councilor. Um, I, I did re receive a communication from a, a local citizen who's, who's here today, and we're, we're happy to see her. And in addition, um, you know, heard, heard from quite a few people on Facebook and just people I talked to. Um, you know, I kind of noticed the litter was getting a little out of hand and being more than it usually was. Um, but then you start talking to other people, and they've been noticing too. So I genuinely think that there has been some kind of change that's causing, you know, a whole lot more beer cans to be dumped on North Lincoln Street. And um, in addition, uh, within the Woodlawn Cemetery, uh, there's, there's quite a bit of trash. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not only North Lincoln Street. Um, but that is an example of one, one of the roads um, in our neighborhood that, that is affected and, and very badly affected. Um, that's the area where we do our salamander crossings. Um, so it's a tourist attraction now. Um, and I'd hate, I'd hate for you know, someone to be out there with their family, uh, moving the salamanders at night, having a great time, learning about nature, and, oh, look at all these beer cans here. Um, so it's, you know, it's a real problem. Um, I'd like to figure out what we can do about it. Um, there's a few things probably we need to do. Um, enforcement is one of them. Um, I'm not always huge on enforcement and, and I'm not always sure that it works. I know it's very difficult to pull off. Um, but I think the word enforcement has some power. Um, so right now we have some signs that say um, littering is unlawful and they're very, they're very cute, they're very keen. Um, I don't think they actually prevent any littering. I think it's almost like a you can litter here sign which um, seems to have been taken to heart. Um, I would like to see something that says uh, something like litter enforcement zone so that people know that, um, you know, this, this is, uh, you, you will get some additional penalty or, you know, so, something will happen in this zone. And I don't, I don't really want to ratchet up penalties. I think, you know, 10 or $20 fine in addition to whatever the existing litter, littering fine if you're in a zone um, might be the way to go. Um, if we do set up some kind of enforcement zones. I think it's important uh, to combine that with um, ways to remove the trash, to have some trash barrels in the area um, so that um, people who are picking up litter uh, have some place to put it. Um, I think uh, Wood Woodlawn Cemetery sp specifically, um, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of trash that goes in there and a lot of it winds up in the wetlands and that's a problem. But if we had um, some trash barrels like at the entrances to, uh, to Woodlawn Cemetery, I think uh, that would make a, a significant difference. Um, and the third important thing is, is just a community and you know, setting a community standard for, you know, we don't, we don't like litter around here. Uh, when we see it, we're gonna do something about it. Um, you know, neighbors, neighbors are encouraged to pick up the trash, throw it in a local trash can. So um, I brought this before, uh, before the committee um, just, just to have a discussion about you know, what, what can we do, what, what are the options, um, like what, what ideas do people have? This is a problem. Um, I mean, litter has been a problem forever, but specifically within the, the last six months uh, in my neighborhood, it's been a big problem. I've been hauling out uh, a lot of, lot of beer cans, a lot of other neighbors have been too. We're getting sick of it. Um, like what, what else can we do? So there you have it. Thank you. Any questions for uh, the counselor? 
Not so much a question, but thank you for bringing this forward. Um, I, I don't think anyone likes litter anywhere. Um, and we have some great initiatives like Green Up, um, Keen, and um, I saw on social media, I think a lot of folks in Keen, when they're out walking, they do try to take a bag and do their part and pick up. Um, clearly, it's not enough. Um, so yeah, I'm open to the, the discussion. Thank you. Yeah, Councilor. The, um, I like to, to walk in a cemetery because it's, um, it's a safe place to walk, but more and more people are partying in the cemetery because I've never seen a police officer go through the cemetery. So if you want to party, you want to drink, especially up by the chapel, that's a nice place to hang out. They just back their cars there. So if you're going down the street, you really can't see them. And so that's where a lot of those beer cans are coming from. And they're dumping them. And as you know, when they go out the gate, they throw them out their car, so when they get home, and a lot of them are underage drinkers. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it seems to be cyclical. I know, Coral remember, because it's probably a little over a decade ago, um, that North Lincoln Street, especially as you go around that initial corner from Beaver, it's, for whatever reason, was a dumping zone. And there was years that we went out there and had to clean up bagfuls of trash that people just found they would dump it you know the old christmas trees um their trash um they dumped it there and as you mentioned um the, the cemetery also seems to be a dumping ground I, I will say that the nights that i've done overnights with the police they do drive through the cemetery but it's an easy place to hide also you know let's face it you can be sitting on you can see headlights from a cruiser coming literally a half mile away in the cemetery so they duck wait for the cruiser to go by but so it is cyclical I, I don't think it's going to be a, an easy answer um telling somebody not to litter is like you know telling somebody that's a bad driver not to speed it's just they ignore it but whatever city staff recommends that might improve the situation um, i think it's a tough situation to do but you know council williams is correct because even before he moved into the house that he's at now that area has always been a problem for a dumping zone north lincoln street and the cemetery historically have, have been a bad area for littering. I've done the uh, Green Up Keen with the realtors, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> our uh, zone typically is Concord, Concord Road and uh, Jordan Road. And, you know, as I'm picking up all kinds of things from uh, auto body parts and uh, mattresses, <laughs> it's, it's just ridiculous. But with the beer cans, it brings to mind, let's go back a click someone has a beer can and they're driving and checking it out the window, that's the problem. So it's obviously uh, driving while drinking. It's not that complicated to figure it out. So perhaps a little tune up on enforcement in those areas might help, but it's just frustrating, frustrating. And you go out there and you're picking it up every year. It's, people are just, they don't care and once it's out of their their car in their hands. So if staff can come up with some brilliant idea, wonderful. I sure put, putting up uh, like a little mini transfer station. <laughs> I don't think really is is the answer. So uh, and bef before we go too far, uh, is, is the uh, uh, the writer of the letter? Yes, I, I just wanted to recognize you. Either chair. Good evening, thank you. Um, so I have a story to tell you about. Oh, did I do something wrong? Okay, I have a story to tell you. So I don't cook, I hate cooking, despise it. I happen to be making a roux one day and I don't know if you know anything about that, it's a huge pain in the neck. So I happen to step outside and I have ring cameras all around my house. I literally saw a person in a minivan, I got it on my ring cameras, saw them throw an alcohol container out their window, got a partial license plate number, and reported it to, and also turned over the ring camera footage to the Keene Police Department. I was told that unfortunately, 
since it was not directly witnessed by a police officer, there was literally nothing they could do about it. That's absurd. We have trash building up all over our neighborhood. It's disgusting. And this woman was driving around with a car full of kids, a minivan full of kids. I mean, I provided a partial license plate, ring camera footage, and a witness statement, and you mean to tell me that there is nothing that can be done about this? I think that you have said it very clearly that there should be a city attorney. As well. I have spoken <laughs> to Harry from uh, the Keene Public Works Department. I've spoken to multiple police officers. I've harassed you two, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> my counselors. No, it's not harassing. It's bringing you to our attention. But uh, it's the amount of trash. And my neighbors have been wonderful. They have. Uh, I had provided trash cans at the uh, foot of my driveway because but I was told that they had to be removed because they were in the right of way or the... Perfect. <laughs> and I said, so can we actually provide a real trash can up here? No, too much liability. I have tried everything to deal with this situation on my own as well as my wonderful neighbors um, and nothing seems to be able to be done. Now, I know you don't like, you know, adding more punitive damages. I'm all for it. <laughs> Okay, uh, but you've definitely indicated that uh, just apprehending uh, the perpetrator of this thing is ridiculous. That well, and there, are, you know, honestly, you look at the trash, and it's two serial litterers. So if you I could catch that Bud Light drinker, oh, <laughs> they'd never find the body. Do you know who's doing it? I do not know who's doing the Bud Light. I caught the twisted tea drinker. <laughs> okay. All right, I don't want to make light of it, but, but it's, it's more than just right in front of you. It's the public's got to wake up and don't do this. It's just... But how, I mean, how much more can, as citizens, we do? You know, I mean, partial license plate, direct witness statement, report to the police, ring camera footage. Uh, city staff will get back to you. Certainly, I mean, again, I'll certainly in a minute. Uh, I know Andy's in the back. Yeah, so if Andy can kind of cut him up, he can talk about cemeteries in a few minutes to kind of give you an idea of how, what they're doing out there. But as you, as you, staying with the public ways for a moment, uh, I, we feel her frustration. It's something where we've been frustrated with for years. Uh, that's why, as Council Williams noted, we have placed up signs reminding people about that they should not be littering because it is a violation of the law. Um, we do have the Green of Keene, as you mentioned. Uh, we do other cleanups along it. Uh, and we do spend um, a, a good amount of our time when, when we get the reports that come in to deal with things that are left along, along the sides of the roads. Um, it is a little frustrating because, again, I think the manager can talk about more about the, the legal side. I know, um, again, w that witness issue is, it, it is an issue, but unfortunately some of these streets there's not necessarily spots where, where somebody can stalk or, or whatever may be. It, it is a challenge for, I think, the, it, it is a societal issue. I mean, one of the things certainly we've talked about in our business and the solid waste side is a bottle, bottle and can law. Because when you start throwing out five cents or ten cents, that sort of starts making people think a little bit and, and, they, and they may not um, do it. Uh, we're right, we do have cereal. Um, litterers because we, we know I said I can tell you on the Jordan Road there there's a certain area that seems to always get the same McDonald's uh, <laughs> wrappings etc because that's probably somebody traveling doing the night shift from down on Optical Avenue going home and they finish up their product and whatever the reason to me they feel even doing it so it is a difficult way uh, one of the things we are talking about Duncan Watson is here he's going to talk to you about solid waste issues in a little bit but one of the things he's been talking about we've been talking about is getting back in a before green up Keen getting a, a PR program with uh, Rebecca Lake, the communications and marketing director, about reminding the community about littering, about that, again, there is a, a level of responsibility that you can take it home or, you, or there, are, there are good disposal areas. Um, I know over the years we have tried placing trash cans out in places, but again, a lot of these places are in locations where there isn't a lot of visibility, which means our trash cans end up either being dumped out and spilled all over, or they end up going away somewhere else. Um, so that's why when we talk about additional liability and problems, that's the experiences that, that, that we've had in trying to tackle this, because this is something that isn't new. I think Councilor Williams is sort of right. Something is in the water, 
even though I supply it, um, seems to have created a little bit more for right now. So I don't know, Andy, I don't know if you want to talk about the cemeteries for a few moments and then um, I'll well, turn over to the, manager, up, uh, and then the manager can uh, I'll let her talk a little bit. An, oh. an additional frustration just popped to mind that if she did identify the license plate, I'm going to let the, the, the I'm police sorry. will not identify who that plate belongs well, to. You, and that would be even more frustrating to me. Anyway. Anyways. Yes. Huh. So, uh, Andy Bohannon, Parks Recreation Facilities Director. So, um, we do place out trash cans within the cemeteries. Uh, they're seasonal, however. They go in uh, in the springtime and out in the, in the fall. It's kind of related to our, our water spigots. So, in um, Woodland Cemetery, we had 11 uh, trash receptacles there last year. Uh, one was stolen, two were damaged and then we have another five over in the green lawn area so um, you can see they're kind of popular whether somebody uses them for something but um, for every one uh, probably every one can that is found uh, by a resident we find probably 50 uh, and um, so it is a definitely problem within uh, the cemeteries our crews are constantly picking them up i oftentimes uh, hope that I don't get pulled over from the cemetery to the rec center with empty containers in the back of my car um, But there, it is fairly prevalent. So I you know, I don't know this is uh, As long as I've been working here, it's always been uh, and you know with a convenience store nearby uh, walking distance the cemetery provides a place of refuge and uh, so you know unfortunately when we do, if we were to put trash cans out um, near the entrances, what happens like everywhere else, we get household trash. Uh, we get, I mean, that doesn't stop it from happening now. But we get microwaves, we get sofa chairs, we get uh, televisions, we get, we get it all. Um, and it's fairly frustrating. And I know that area has been notorious uh, in the years, as uh, Director Blomquist had mentioned, but, um, yeah, it's it's something that we constantly are are picking up within the cemetery. Um, as we're just talking about this, the the ring cam footage, and I know there's some legal aspect to it. I'm I'm sure, and I'll, I'll wait for that. Um, but one thing that just keeps coming back to me is we as a city really need to use technology to our advantage in situations like this. We tell people, see something, say something. Mm -hmm. um, I, as a citizen, I could imagine how frustrating that is to do just that and be told, sorry, there's nothing that can be done. Um, there's, I've traveled to other places. I know as far as every time we have the discussion about enforcement, we talk about the shortage of police in the city and that enforcing things are difficult because of the staffing shortage in the police department. Again, we've got to start thinking of using technology to our advantage. Um, if people have those ring cams, um, there's programs where, and I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, we as a, uh, uh, we ask citizens to release that information to the police, th that footage. Um, for other crime solving um, tactics. We can use it even for traffic enforcement. Um, Maryland has done that with video to, to track speeding. I know it's cost, but. No, unfortunately yeah. here in New it's Hampshire, you, again, you can't. That's yeah. why we don't have, there was a discussion on the council about the red light cameras. And again, in the state of New Hampshire, unless you can identify the driver, it's not the car. See, in Maryland, it's an administrative it's an administrative fee. It's not a criminal one. Yeah. So that that this is part of our live free and die issue. Yeah. But we need we should be having this discussion in this setting, I, and maybe yes. as a council we can petition the state legislator to look at that um, because it is a problem, and other communities are have the same staffing mm -hmm. shortage as us. We're not alone in that. So just. Again, I, I'm asking when we're looking at this problem to use all the tools in our toolbox. Thank you. Okay, uh, Attorney Mullins, following on that, so if there was a camera that saw 
beer can flying out the window and could identify the license plate. Is that? <laughs> there are a couple of things. Um, a couple of things. First of all, littering is one of those things that appears in a number of places in state law. Uh, and not entirely always consistently. Uh, unfortunately, we were just sort of, Amanda and I were just sort of perusing through these. Uh, the general litter control law, or say 163B, um, which basically makes it a, a misdemeanor level offense uh, to, you know, litter. Uh, and, uh, you know, and as a misdemeanor level offense, it does come, it's a criminal offense, so you have to, it's a beyond the reasonable doubt standard, you have to be able to establish it. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, both here and in the statutes dealing with the uh, rights of way, uh, there is language that basically says that uh, evidence uh, that litter is being thrown from a motor vehicle or a boat, other airplanes, um, is prima facie evidence that the operator of the vehicle violated the law. So, I mean, this is a conversation that we're going to have to have internally, I think, uh, with the city manager and the police department. I mean, I. This is the first I've really thought about it in, in, in connection with this. I'm, I apologize. I thought it was just a general, a general letter uh, about uh, littering, but it seems to me that depending upon what the evidence is uh, that's being presented, uh, that you may have a uh, cause of action uh, under, uh, especially under 163B. Uh, the other statute, which comes up under 265, um, which deals with, you know, roads and streets and such. It's interesting that there, uh, it's only a violation level offense, uh, not a misdemeanor level offense. So there is some conflict. Uh, the other proposed uh, possible suggestion with respect to signage is you could just state that. Littering is a criminal offense. Don't do it. <laughs> but that's up to the city and the city manager and everybody else to like our talk about. Smoking and drugs, don't do <laughs> right. it. Right. <laughs> smoking and drugs. But... If uh, a full license plate was identified, it's not going to... I, I think you would probably need more than that. The, but the rink, the rink well, I, well, in order to be able to tie the two together, because anybody could say, oh, here's a license plate number. Okay, uh, I think somebody, you know, I, I saw this person litter. But right? on ca on I, mean, I think you would be. need to have more in order to make, you know, to, to establish enough probable cause to go forward with it. But depending upon what the evidence is, you may be able to do that. All right, great. Uh, I, th I think we just need public cooperation. I don't think that this is going to rise to the uh, task force level or something. <laughs> and certainly, I don't want to see more signs. But uh, anything further, uh, Council Williams or public? I still have a him again. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't have anything further to say. Just that uh, you know, specifically along North Lincoln Street, I think uh, I think some trash cans would be helpful. Okay, thank you. you. Could demarcate where's your house and just <laughs> chuck it right in your driveway and be done with it. Okay. Yes. Just a, a quick question. Going back to cameras, I was going to ask that earlier, especially these uh, areas that we have, as we've had in the years, North Lincoln Street in the cemetery up near the chapel. If, if we put up city-owned um, cam trail cameras, you know, whether or not, you know, if, if we told, the, if we put out publicly that we are putting these cameras out, you know, what, I don't know how much we could use them down the road or whatever, it's, we, but if somebody's dumping trash like on North Lincoln Street around the corner as you're heading off from Beaver Street, and we put a sign there, these areas are monitored by cameras, you know, I'm just wondering, you know, it might have a positive effect. Now, I don't know down the road how much we'd use it for evidence, you know, based on law. But I think, for example, in the cemeteries, if the signs were there, these, these businesses use them all the time, whether the cameras are real or not. You know, you go into a little mom and pop shop and you'll see the sign, you know, you are being watched on a camera. Now, whether the camera is real or not, people are aware that there's a camera there. And it's a deterrent for shoplifting. This could be a deterrent for littering. So I'm just wondering the legal ramifications of that. There is, and I will have to locate it again. I, I actually uh, looked at it not that long ago for a, a request from the police department in connection with some criminal activity to adjust a 
city-owned camera to try and capture that activity. Uh, there is a specific statute with respect to the use of video cameras for that purpose. And, and, it, and I'm, from what I recall, there were significant restrictions on using that camera to capture motor vehicles, motor vehicle license plates, and, dro and operators. Uh, under sort of the privacy uh, mm -hmm. issues. So I would have to look at that again. But I, as I recall, that was uh, a, a bit of a stumbling block that we had to get past. Yeah, I know, that. For the, I know in the public way there is, and because we've been talking about them, use for traffic, to, ma to manage traffic. And there is, mm -hmm. yeah. there is a question about, again, whether you can take, just have video going on on the public way. Remembering now, most That's ring cameras right. are on private property. Now they happen to be capturing activity on the public way, but to specifically put cameras in the public way, and this, again, this all falls back to why we don't have um, red, red, we can't put up the, the red light cameras. So there is, there is some conflicting and, and some challenges on use of, specifically governmental use of cameras in the right of way. To RSA 236, 130, we just discovered My follow up to that is that state that. RSA yes. that requires this. Okay. Yes. I, I happen to have good connections with a state rep right now that I'm sure I can get a bill submitted. <laughs> so if I can get the RSAs in the, in the RSA that needs changing, I will, I will make a, a contact to an individual who's at the state house and see if we can get um, an RSA changed. If you're going to be doing that, would you change RSA 260-14, the Driver Privacy Protection Act, for me, yes. too, please? Uh, just, just give me the list, right. and I'll push it on. The thing okay. is impenetrable. Yes. <laughs> okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, moving forward. Uh, anything further from the public? Counselor? Yeah. A motion, please. I move to recommend that the communication be referred to the city manager for further action. Second. Motion's made and seconded. Anything further from the committee? Public, all in favor? You can vote, Bobby. It's your letter. <laughs> and, and thank you for bringing it to our attention, and thank you for bringing it in. And I feel your pain <laughs> and frustration. Okay, <clears throat> next item uh, is regarding the transfer station. It's an update, <clears throat> and you know, frankly, uh, I was approached uh, with some questions regarding some of the. Uh, things going on at the transfer station, operations out there, and, and I, I briefly corresponded with the city manager whether it's an FOP or an MSFI, and we have a pretty light agenda, so we're here, and so is Duncan. Yes, sir, so can you fill us in, and then I'll ask you my specific questions when your presentations. Um, yeah, Duncan Watson, Assistant Public Works Director, Solid Waste Manager. Yeah, I, I'm happy to. Uh, I'm going to give you a, a you know, a 10,000 foot overview, um, you know, with a couple of PowerPoint slides, and then and then you know, basically give you some maybe these answer some of your questions, and if they don't, then I'm more than happy to answer any Thank questions you. you might have. Uh, so I just wanted to give you a uh, a quick overview of you know sort of how things operate at the transfer station. Um, you know, the, the amount of tonnage that we operate up there. So the, uh, the solid waste program in the city of Keene, um, we operate a transfer station and a recycling center, along with monitoring a closed landfill, operating a, a biofuel to energy system. We do household hazardous waste collections, uh, and we, we do other services uh, re related to waste diversion and waste disposal up there. Um, we take in approximately 26,000 tons of refuse at the transfer station, in addition to 8,700 tons of construction and demolition debris. And we process about 5,000 tons of recycling uh, per year. That number of recycling has stayed fairly static over the years, even though we're actually physically processing more containers because um, maybe you've noticed the trend over the past uh, decade or so where they're doing a lot more light weighting of containers, particularly shifting containers into plastic containers, moving from glass to, to plastic. And then even within the plastic containers, the plastic containers are considerably thinner and lighter than they used to be. So we handle a lot more physical product than we ever used to, but our tonnage isn't necessarily growing. So um, that's, you know, just, that's just one of the trends that we're seeing. Uh, obviously, we have a 23,000 population, which increases dramatically during the daytime. Um, we have our solid waste fund, which is structured as a special revenue fund, which means that there's no impact to the tax rate. It's completely funded by revenue that we receive at the transfer station and the sale of our recycling, recycling commodities. 
which covers the cost of our solid waste operation. Our, our revenues and our expenses are approximately equal and around in the, in the $5 million per year range. We have cost centers that include our administration of the facility and the operations, the recycling center, the transfer station, the hazardous waste facility, the uh, demolition and recycling, uh, demolition recycling, uh, the landfill monitoring and our landfill gas monitoring as well as our energy system which is sort of part of that same cost center. We employ uh, eight people full-time and five people part-time uh, and our, our transportation and disposal of the material from our transfer station as well as the uh, shipping of commodities is all, all done by the private sector. Um, anybody that wants to offer a waste collection uh, service in the City of Keene must be permitted. Uh, and we currently have 14 permitted haulers in the City of Keene. This includes anybody from the size of a waste management type of a national corporation to a person operating a pickup truck with a, just a few customers in, in town. Um, the terms of the permit require them to do certain things. Uh, in addition to um, offering, making sure that people can, can access recycling, it also means that the uh, solid waste that's generated in the city of Keene must stay in the city of Keene uh, using a flow control ordinance that was passed many, many years ago in city council. This is, ensures our ability to uh, get the material to uh, help fund our operations and, and, and pay for the expenses that the city has invested in over the years. Um, right now, um, all the waste that's received at the transfer station is, uh, is transported to Turnkey Landfill over in Rochester, New Hampshire. Uh, we are in the second year of, uh, we just began the second year of a three-year contract that we have with waste management. Uh, we have no renewal clauses left in our contract with waste management so that uh, at the end of December 21st, 2024, uh, well, long before that, we'll be having to assemble a request for proposal and go out to, to bid to, to locate a, uh, a transportation and disposal source for our solid waste uh, in the City of Keene. Uh, our current tip fee of the City of Keene is $164 per ton. Uh, the transportation and disposal of that same waste when we bring it to Rochester, New Hampshire, and we, we, we have what's called a gate rate, so the, the, the rate that you pay when you arrive at that facility is $82 per ton. So the, the differential between the $164 and the $82, uh, that, that money goes to fund the operate, part of the operations that don't generate revenue at the, uh, at the solid waste facility. Those include hazardous waste collections, uh, our biofuel energy system, um, and in addition to administrative fees that we paid towards the general fund to help with, uh, oversee the, uh, the, the solid waste operation, you know, and, and, and a lot more. I'm just trying to keep a, you know, a, a general overview. Uh, the current gate rates for surrounding uh, transfer stations uh, over in Brattleboro, Vermont, Triple T operates uh, a transfer station and they currently charge $200 per ton. And Monadnock Disposal in Jaffrey, New Hampshire currently charges $165 as their gate rate. Um, there is, you know, without getting too deep into this, there's a looming uh, crisis uh, going on in New Hampshire. Um, existing capacity is uh, expected to last through the early 2030s. Um, Massachusetts has effectively um, shut down all of their disposal facilities other than their waste energy facilities that they have. Um, and as you can imagine, it's quite difficult to site a new landfill. There's an ongoing issue up in the Bethlehem Dalton area where uh, Casella Waste is trying to site a new landfill and that's running into a host of problems. Um, there is, as I said, capacity right now through 2030s, early 2030s. I think 2034 is when, when, we, when, we, when we cross that threshold of not having adequate capacity. Um, but right now, one of the things that exacerbates um, the, the, the disposal capacity in, this, in, in New Hampshire is that um, tremendous amount of waste. About 50% of the waste that's received in New Hampshire of disposal facilities comes from out of state. Um, and there's, there's, no, there's no regulations that prevent that because there's an interstate commerce clause and we don't have regulations that are, that are promulgated through the, um, through the legislature or uh, administered by the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services that puts any limits on that. Uh, so, so people are free to use the, the marketplace to dispose of, of waste at their, at their most convenient and most economical location. Um, but in some locations, even some of our surrounding states, currently Massachusetts has a number of facilities that currently uh, truck and or rail transport uh, huge volumes of waste as far as Louisiana and going into Indiana and Ohio. Uh, and this trend will continue if, if we don't site new facilities. 
Um, as, as we've you know, mentioned before, our model of keeping the, our, our business model off of the tax rate so that uh, we, we, we don't add to that tax rate burden um, is, is, is questionable as to whether it's sustainable after this existing contract ends. And that's something that you know, we're, we're aware of. Uh, we talk about it fairly frequently, and uh, I think that we'll be prepared to, um, to have a, a, promote a good program when, when that time comes. Um, but you know you should be at least aware that this is something of, of, of concern, and uh, there is no magic solution to it. But that um, you know we'll, we'll work to do our best to keep this business model working because um, we're you know Keene is unique in the sense that we're the only municipality in the state of New Hampshire that does not have a, uh, in part or fully have their solid waste program on the tax rate. Uh, so this is you know a feature of our program, and uh, I think people appreciate that, and we will want to try to continue that. I would say that one of the um, uh, features, as we were talking about uh, littering, uh, roadside littering earlier, is that one of the features of our contract um, is that we, within our contract, we have a uh, provision in there that requires uh, our contractor, in this case waste management, and they subcontract it out to somebody else, but they, they patrol they, they, uh, once a month from March through uh, November. Uh, they hire a crew to go from the intersections of Route 9, 10, 12, up to the transfer station and uh, pick up litter along that entire corridor because as you can imagine um, over the years, um, you know, in the 31 years that I've been here, uh, it's been a giant problem where um, people transporting material to the transfer station oftentimes have that material in the, in the back of a pickup truck and either they didn't take physics in high school or they don't <laughs> care um, and some of that litter ends up blowing out on the side, a lot of that litter ends up blowing out on the side of the road. So that um, we've managed you know, over the last decade or so through this contract with waste management to um, provide uh, litter, litter control along that, along that corridor and that's made a, a tremendous difference. Um, but you know, uh, increasing the awareness of roadside littering and whatnot is, is, is you know, aside from the empirically uh, evidence-based, uh, undoubtedly best program that you can possibly do to prevent roadside litter, which is a bottle bill as Court mentioned before, um, but um, I, though that's been proposed in the New Hampshire legislature uh, probably a billion times at this point. Um, and I should live so long that it comes into fruition. But, um, you know, these kinds of things that we can do, you know, working something into a contract to have a, a company help provide litter collection is, is, a, is a good feature for us. So that's just a really high-level overview. If you had specific questions, I'm more than happy to, uh, to take your questions. You. Yeah, and I think your presentation is really fine for MSFI, you know, high level is good. <clears throat> I, I did have a couple of specific questions sure. that spark uh, my request to have this conversation. Uh, the rate increase that recently went in, mm -hmm. uh, we recently voted on changing the, uh, the budget for the money in and the money out mm -hmm. so it stays neutral. So our, uh, the quantity has increased which is what sparked that. Why, why was there a rate increase? Well, the rate increase um, has, has happened um, every year for um, you know, the entire term that we've had a, a contract waste management. Um, there is a built-in rate increase for waste management through their contract, and we literally mirror that, that rate increase in our, in our proposed tipping fees so that we, that we keep our, our fund um, you know, basically whole. Um, so that we don't, we're not, we're not raising it any more than what, what, weight man, what weight ma waste management raises our tipping fee by. And specifically, uh, there was comment of the notification that it, it was really short. Yeah, yeah, that 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 you know clearly is an oversight. I actually put a reminder in my in my calendar for you know usually that that notification comes out in in, in sometime in the November time frame, and, and unfortunately the notification came out a, a bit later than we would want it okay. to. Um, and that, that I own that, but I, I have uh, you know bells and whistles will go off in uh, for November 1st to remind me to put the notification out because there is a built-in cost fee increase uh, beginning on January 1st in 2024. Okay, I was on the receiving end <laughs> in my January bill. Sure, and I understand that. Uh, you answered the question regarding the RFP. Uh, I truly don't remember the last RFP, so I wonder was that just an auto? Uh, Renewal clause within the previous contract. Yeah, we, we have some renewal clauses. I mean, if you if you recall back, I mean, you you were on you've been on the city council for a while, so you remember yeah. probably back in the days when we actually had waste management operating the transfer station for a while there. Um, there was various reasons why that didn't work out for them, and so ultimately the city took over operation of the transfer station. But we've always had pri the private sector 
transporting and disposing of our solid waste because that 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 you know the infrastructure just to transport using tractor trailers just just isn't within our it's not it's not in our wheelhouse no i get it i get it but yeah. very definitely you said that we are in the second year of a three-year right so there will be a real rfp coming out and well, we have no provision to renew our existing contract, so that we will be we will we we will have to go out for an yeah. RFP. Yes. So, if another party is interested, that's yes. their opportunity. Yep. And you answered that yes, all the small haulers are licensed. <clears throat> and thinking back to my time, his time, uh, everyone paying? Are they all reasonably current? <laughs> Uh, we have one hauler right now um, who is in arrears um, and they're in violation of their permit. They've been notified by certified mail. Uh, I'm working with the, the Revenue Collection Department and the Finance Department as well as the City Attorney's Office to keep abreast of that. There's, uh, you know, it's difficult because we don't really have a, a trash police even though we have enforcement provisions in there. Um, you know, what, 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 it's, it's one of those things where we have a pretty good network of, of people who are abiding by the regulations and rules, and when somebody runs afoul of them, they don't hesitate to, to pick up the phone and call me and let me know that. Uh, I do know of one hauler who has gotten into arrears. We've, we've been monitoring that very carefully and set up a program for them to get themselves whole. Um, that, I believe that process is frankly still ongoing, and sometimes it gets resolved and then it starts all over again. Yeah. Um, no, I get it. You know, yeah. Small business, it <laughs> yeah, and this is you know a fairly you know, all things considered small hauler, but you know they, they, any anybody who's a permitted hauler needs to abide by the regulations, and, and right now one of them is not. Okay, I'm just thinking back to 10, 15 years ago when we all were young. Yes. <laughs> there yes. Was, uh, I, I remember which one we're talking yeah, about. Yeah. Okay. Sure. I'm sure it's not him. <laughs> it's not him. But anyway, just don't want to see it happen again. I, I think it's just our responsibility every now and then to raise the flag and poke a little. All right, you've Absolutely. answered everything that I had on my mind, and okay. I was asked, and I'm a regular customer out there, and I truly invite you all uh, to go out, see the operation. It's not easy. It's, it, it's pretty crazy, really. And, you know, when I go out with the dump trailer and the guys are there, they're very, very nice, very polite, and very, very helpful, so... And yeah, appreciate it's all, that. It's all good. And, and I think from my perspective work. as director, that's probably one of the more one of my most difficult places for employees to work. Not just environmentally, if you've never been up there in February and worked with the folks on that. Oh, it's line. July when it's really hot. July at least you, you feel warm, but in February it's a bit but it's also a place where people feel why should they pay for something they don't want anymore? And, and that also sort of goes back to this whole littering issue, too, is that this idea when people have something that has no longer value to them, it's like, why do I have to, again, spend a resource to, to, to get rid of it? So that they do, a, they do a very good job of working with those folks who, who kind of have that view of life. Um, but at the end of the day, as, you, as, as the committee knows and, and hopefully the public recognizes, there is a cost, whether they throw it out the window because it's going to take somebody's energy. The city, actually, the general fund has to pay. If it picks up by my general fund crews, general fund pays off the ticket there to, to ship it off to there. So um, this is a good opportunity. I think I appreciate it to, to talk about these things. And hopefully it's also being on TV and the Internet through uh, YouTube. It's also an education to, for folks to, to think and understand that, yeah, there is a cost to get rid of something you may not want. Committee questions? Councilor. Um, you mentioned uh, something about a biofuels program up there. Can you uh, elaborate a bit? Oh, well, that the biofuels generator replaced our landfill gas energy generator. Uh, so when we, when, we, uh, when we were shifting from the landfill gas generator to uh, uh, needing a new power source, we did an evaluation that determined uh, that, that the biofuel generator would be our best option versus running the three-phase power lines up, for, which currently terminate at Blackbrook North. Um, we also looked at solar, solar with energy storage. We looked at those three options, and uh, we, we, we decided that uh, you know, the, the most economical and efficient way to, to continue to be able to provide the necessary prime power was to uh, install a generator that instead of running on um, petroleum diesel that runs on, on, on biofuel. Okay, so you were talking about a generator that uses biofuels, not something that generates biofuels, which That's is correct. kind of where I was going with yeah. biogas and yeah. that kind of thing. We, well, we do collect cooking oil at the recycling center. Um, it's not; it's a little known fact, but um, we we we, we um, collect that, and then and then a vendor comes by and, and collects it, and, and then they refine it. But I mean, we're talking you know very small amounts. Mm -hmm. 
Anything else? Anything else? Anything from the public? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Nick Germana. I uh, live on uh, Baker Street, 206 Baker Street. I'm also uh, a state rep. And uh, I would not have thought a year ago before I ran, decided to run for state legislature that I'd get up at a meeting and talk about solid waste. But uh, I just want, I'm on the Environment and Agriculture Committee. And so I wanted to actually give you my card. Great, um, let's say we had a couple of bills this week that we heard uh, testimony on that I think were, were promising, particularly around food waste disposal. Uh, I think nationally the statistics are about a quarter of the waste that goes into landfills is food waste. Uh, and that's, that tends to be true in there are some communities in the state, Lebanon and Hopkinton, I think, who have specific, some specific programs dealing with food waste and they're also around a quarter of their um, landfill is, is food waste. And so there are a couple of bills in the legislature right now that I could tell you about or we could talk about sometime. One would be similar to what is done in Massachusetts and in Vermont in terms of uh, for people who are producing, say, I think it's a ton of food waste or more per, uh, I forget if it's week or month, uh, right offhand, but uh, requiring a specific kind of, of disposal of that uh, so that it's not going into to landfills, that it has to go to certain areas that take the, the food waste. Um, and the idea then would, would be to, to get, you know, say Hannaford, for example, or even Keene State College or other places in the area that produce a significant amount of food waste, first of all, to find ways to minimize their food waste, uh, but also to require them up to a certain amount, say a ton, to find ways to dispose of that that doesn't end up in landfills. And there are similar, I believe, laws in Massachusetts and, and uh, Vermont. Um, and then the other bill was, uh, well, it's, there was a fund, this is such a New Hampshire thing, I think, a fund that was created last year, I forget the name of it offhand, but it was about trying to minimize waste, and it was a, a fund that was not given any money, right? So it's, they created the fund and then put no money in it. Uh, and so the hope is to get a $2 million appropriation, and it's, it's I, again, I could get the, the specifics for you. Um, and a million of that would be used to provide grants to localities to help them develop various kinds of programs. So I forget which community it was, uh, for example, was talking about something connected to their schools uh, around food waste. And, and one of the things the school did, uh, the school did was some food kind of tracking to see, you know, what it was mainly that they were throwing most of away that was left over from student lunches, et cetera which helps the school in the sense that it helps them actually make some kind of buying decisions, right? Uh, students aren't eating this, we should buy less of it, uh, but can also inform them in ways that could help them, um, even building it into their curriculum to minimize the school food waste. So there are a couple of bills that are designed to be able to relieve that burden on communities and kind of lower, uh, lower some of the rates, but also thinking about the capacity that we're running out of. If we could find ways to divert larger amounts of that quarter of, of that waste, which is food waste, which can be used for lots of other really productive things, right? So Hannaford and, and some other uh, stores and other places, you know, they, I, I know, have some uh, relationships with community kitchens sometimes, right? So they'll be able to get some food before, you know, by that best buy date or whatever uh, to food kitchens. Uh, and there are other things that can be done in terms of composting. Uh, so in any event, I just wanted to, uh, to, to point that out and given the capacity issues, if we could find a way to get food waste away as much as possible from landfills, it would at least help kind of mitigate some of the, uh, the stresses on capacity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other comments from the public or committee? Yeah. Um, just to follow up on the food waste, you know, we've got an excellent Elm City compost initiative in this in this city, and um, I'd love to see uh, I'd love to see everybody compost. Yeah. Um, just one other thing, El Elm City Compost does does do a good job. They've they've uh, been the first uh, company out of. Uh, I've had at least a dozen people come to me looking to start up a food waste collection business. And you know, I've been very encouraging because the city of Keene actually is currently permitted through the DES to accept food waste at our, in our compost pile up at the recycling center. But our, our permit is limited right now to pre-plate food waste, which means that 
um, you know, anything that is uh, done in food preparation. So, you know, because there are different requirements for composting when you, when you start adding meat and dairy and oils into the mix, you, you need a much more hot compost pile in order to break those, those items down and, and also to prevent it from, you know, getting um, to smell bad. Um, but we had did we did a pilot uh, not too long ago where we uh, where we uh, uh, gave uh, some subterranean uh, compost bins to uh, various keen residents uh, and and our the results of that of that pilot study were were very encouraging because that's what we've been promoting for many years is the 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 the, the opportunity to, to compost your material in your backyard now obviously. You know, it's problematic potentially to just throw, you know, a, you know, you don't want this piece of salami and you throw it in your backyard compost bin, you're likely to attract things you don't want at your house. Um, but the thing that we tried was, you know, if you bury uh, a compost bin in the ground and put those things in, um, you know, all the, the, the bugs and whatnot love that stuff and they break it down and it, it turns into basically nothingness. And, you know, that, that showed some promise, but I think that, you know, to the, to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, the state rep's point, uh, there is a huge potential with uh, food waste and diversion of food waste to a higher and better use than bringing it to the transfer station or just throwing it into the regular trash. And this is an area that, that I see of tremendous growth for the city of Keene. Thank you. Anything further, committee, public? Uh, Mr. Watson, thank you very, very much for You're coming. Welcome. Good presentation. Thank you. All my questions are answered, and I think we carried some good words forward. <clears throat> So a motion, please. Yeah. Will we accept the presentation as informational? Second. Motion's made and seconded. Anything from the committee? Public? Seeing none, all in favor? Unanimous, and I thank you. Uh, final item on our agenda. Nope, we have two of them. Uh, this is a carry forward uh, regarding Chapter 58, Parks, Recreation, and City Unimproved Land Director. When did that change? Uh, no more titles, please. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> thank you uh, for joining us this evening. Uh, thank you again. Andy Bohannon, Parks Recreation Facilities Director. Uh, and, so, and unimproved land. Uh, or, or, or uh, yes, yes. We can, <laughs> there's many different titles. It's almost I think as long a title as he has now. <laughs> yes. Uh, I think I got it longer than that, mm -hmm. almost. <laughs> Um, so before you today, about a year and a half ago, there was a conversation related before this committee related to uh, no smoking. And uh, that kind of was the impetus behind uh, moving forward with Chapter 58 uh, and looking at the revision of, of the, it really needed, um, the last time it was revised was in 2003. And uh, it was semi-specific to um, specific parks, but yet, not all the parks were listed within the uh, ordinance. So uh, what we took a little bit of time to come forward and review that and um, take an opportunity to basically change a lot of the language that was already in it. You know, revoke and replace a specific, I say outdated language that makes it sound like it's really old, but it doesn't really seem that old. It was before I started, but not that long ago. Um, and really wanted to make sure that when we do this, uh, we had the opportunity to kind of delineate uh, city parks and then the unimproved land because it was kind of melded together in the last piece uh, and really not that clarify, clarifying. So um, we believe that we did it. Um, some of the highlights uh, for you, just uh, I know that you've got a copy of this and this is going to go through first reading at the next uh, council cycle and then We'll be back before you again at the next MSFI cycle. Um, but just m making sure that we did list all of the parks. Uh, you'll see in there a Keene Forestry Park. Um, even though that is listed as a park, we still have to abide by all the FAA uh, guidelines uh, related to uh, that area um, if we were to do anything within that space. Um, we did update uh, the uh, list of prohibited uses within City Park, and you'll find in there uh, the work of the uh, Housing Stability Committee, and when we came forward in front of that, uh, they've changed the language to the no camping, 
uh, and updated that language to reflect uh, what we had shared with the Housing Stability Committee. Um, we also uh, consistently, you would find in, in the past ordinance, uh, different times uh, for different parks uh, in certain cases. Uh, so we just made that consistent. And now that we've listed all the parks, our signage can be consistent. Uh, and that was really the premise of a lot of these changes is just being consistent across the board. Uh, so we didn't have one park having one set of rules and another park having another set. And if you, uh, in the past, you had uh, information about Robin Hood and Beach Hill, which is kind of the same as Wheelock and uh, Ash Willett, and just making it all consistent. So that was really uh, a lot of the premise. Uh, we did put some language in there that kind of reflects uh, some of the conversations we've had over the past year related to third parties working in park lands, uh, specifically like Eversource working on their transmission lines, getting into Goose Pond. Um, so uh, there's quite a bit of changes. Uh, there's, If there's any questions, I think one of the things we also had to do was related to Chapter 6. Uh, there's a reference within Chapter uh, 58 to ch uh, Chapter 6 related to alcohol, uh, consumption of alcohol beverages, um, and we've updated that. So um, there's just, like we said, there's a lot of consistencies that weren't being done previously, and we're, we've gone ahead and done that. So, um, but I think we'll, we'll find this to be a better, better ordinance. Questions? <clears throat> Committee? City attorney. Yeah, just to point out, I think Andy did a great job uh, as the public parks and facilities director. Uh, but I did want to point out that the other the other big change in this was to clarify not only what were parks, but what were not parks. Yeah. Um, in terms of the and that's where the city unimproved land comes into play. Uh, chapter fifty eight basically just kind of threw all of this stuff into one spot. And it wasn't very, uh, it was hard to understand, it wasn't very well organized, and it wasn't very well delineated. So you will note that we have made now a specific uh, determination as to city unimproved land. And basically, those are the lands that don't fall under uh, the park's uh, designation, and they're sort of open space land, and some of it is under conservation easement, some of it is not. Uh, but that it falls now under the... Uh, the purview of the public uh, works uh, director uh, with respect to uh, the use uh, of those particular areas and, and the prohibitions uh, that have been included in the parks in general uh, also apply in the unimproved uh, properties. So we did want to point that out to uh, the committee. The other thing to point out in this uh, from our perspective is you will note that this chapter does not specifically include Railroad Square mm -hmm. or Central Square. Correct. Um, we spent a fair amount of time in discussion on that. <laughs> Those two locations are pretty unique uh, within the city uh, and don't really uh, lend themselves to the same uh, issues as the parks do uh, with respect to use and regulation and that sort of thing. So the plan at this point is to come back to the city council uh, with an update to the, there are a couple of resolutions that apply to some railroad square and central square. Uh, and we are now going to, the next step in this process is to rework those and to come back to the city council at that point. In the beginning, this started out with not smoking and not doing drugs in the parks. Where, is that anywhere in this or? So uh, we, we, put specific language in related to uh, the smoking aspect, the no tobacco. Um, I just want to make sure I find it. I know it's here. That's top of page nine. Yeah. But by the city attorney, that would not include Railroad Square. This, this language does not incorporate Railroad Square. This language does not incorporate Railroad Square or Central Square, which is why we're going to be coming back to you. Those two really do need their own review look at this point. Okay, but the Pat, new Pat Russell Park. Pat is, Russell Park is in here. That is in there. Yep. All right. And Mr. Chairman, on, on the Railroad Square, that's also in flux as we're looking at the downtown. 
what we think of as railroad square today may not be the railroad square of tomorrow. So that's why that was important, particularly for that space, to sort of hold that out for now. Um, because as that gets the concepts and the design work for that area um, with Andy's input, we'll sort of direct how that can be used or more importantly, maybe what you don't want to use particularly in that space. All right. And I would just uh, recall from our conversation related to the no drugs and no tobacco, the language specifically is use of tobacco products uh, that are prohibited in all parks. Drugs are already illegal, uh, so we didn't need to uh, put that language in. Uh, so uh, that's where we went with that. But it would be within your purview to create a sign that said no tobacco or drugs. Uh, yes, certainly we could put signage yeah, up one, that says. One hurt. Yeah. And no littering. And those are already up. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. And the other, I guess the other thing is, that, as the city attorney identified, and I, and I need to certainly let you know, this bringing together of unimproved lands is, is an additional workload for the department because previously we had properties that the city accepted, et cetera, that really didn't go anywhere. And really it was between uh, the Parks and Rec Department and our department, we sort of were trying to manage them. But clearly this is now placing the management under, underneath one area, but certainly it, it is something, at least from my perspective, is another item that we're now going to be working. You so, are. Yes, which was not necessarily there before. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Just to say that I wouldn't mind seeing some of that city-owned, unimproved land sold off to the private sector so housing could be built. Well, unfortunately, most of it is has either restrictions because like I said it's been accepted with, with, with when there was gifts with certain conditions by the gift giver or at some point we place the city place conservation open space easements on it and the other few remaining pieces mostly are not accessible to what would typically typically we get property no one else wants yeah. because it's not developable well there's one place in my neighborhood that looks like it could fit a Fit a triplex, so yeah, perhaps. <laughs> if you looked at the flood mapping, probably not. <laughs> oh, it's up high. <laughs> well, I know okay, the piece. anything further? Questions, comments? Public? Thank you for being with us this evening. Welcome. And, Thank you. Uh, Council Roberts. Move to recommend that the city attorney be instructed to introduce. An ordinance for first reading that would amend chapter 58 as instructed by the committee. Second. second. Motion's been made and seconded. Anything from the committee or public? Seeing none, all in favor? Unanimous. Thank you, sir. Thank Drive you. Safe. So just to be clear on that, I'm, I'm going to submit that ordinance into the next council meeting, even though this is coming out as a recommendation. I think we'll go forward with it at that yeah. point if there's no objection. Good for me. Good. <clears throat> and now, the final item, uh, removal of a stop sign on Summit Road near Wyman Road, uh, otherwise known as Ordinance uh, 02023-01. Good evening. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair, Don Lucia, City Engineer. Um, try to keep this uh, brief and simple for you. Um, some of the folks here on the committee are probably old enough to remember when uh, Summit Road was the state highway, when it was Route 12. Um, so I... I you know, apologize for, for going old school on you, but I pulled this graphic together at the last minute, so no, no fancy graphics tonight. But uh, this here on the map is what we now know of as Route 12. This is Wyman Road. This is Corporate Drive. This little stub of a road right here is where Wyman Road used to be. And this is what we know as Summit Road. Um, Summit Road was cut off right at the end here um, when the, the bypass was built and Wyman Road was relocated to come out as a T intersection onto the, the new state highway. Um, just recently the, the transportation and stormwater manager, previously known as the highway superintendent, came to me and said, hey, why do we have these two stop signs uh, located in the middle of, of nowhere here? Um, and the reason is because they, they date back to when that was a much busier intersection, you know, c conveying traffic to Wyman Road and also the State Highway. Um, 
Today, you'll find there is one property that has a uh, you know, building on that stub of Wyman Road. Um, it's, it's part of the CNS uh, wholesale grocery complex, the, the campus there. Um, I don't know if a lot of activity happens in that building, but it is part of their property. Summit Road, from this point on, is essentially uh, an extension of a driveway for two or three private residences. Um, so bottom line is that there's very, very little traffic um, at this far end of Summit Road. I put some photos here. Uh, this is the, the intersection looking at it from Wyman Road, that stub. This is the, the same uh, Google Street View as you're looking at it from the northern end of Summit Road looking back towards the city. Um, but bottom line is there's, there's just very little traffic. These stop signs really aren't warranted according to the MUTCD, um, and it's just an unnecessary expense to replace them uh, and you know keep them look, looking proper and, and modern. Um, so we recommend that they be removed from city code and we'll take them down. Nothing, <clears throat> nothing concerning CNS uh, in any of the original uh, agreements or no. you know, qu Quite honestly, I didn't uh, contact CNS to talk about this, um, but this is a, a public right-of-way issue more than, than a private property owner Just issue. Asking the question, remembering way back that there was some uh, covenants that and they could use one ex exit, not the other. And yeah, and, and the, the, that fits... This building that's that's uh, one more. Uh, this building is part of their parcel, um, but it doesn't have. You can see here, there's there's no driveway connecting it to the main campus, so it's sort of like a, an isolated facility. The rest of their campus is accessed through Corporate Drive, um, so it's it's kind of uh, like a satellite facility almost. Well, I, and I I don't know I what they use it for today. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, yeah. I think I can answer the question, since I was here when we negotiated all those things for that development the answer is no there was no specific okay. item for this particular just site bring it up nope and when i hear cns i just want to make sure no nope. there's happy. there's nothing and i think what's more important too i think say engine can confirm it what how the stop condition now becomes it becomes the rules of the road which means Correct. the minor street traffic would stop for the main street so in this case the wyman road traffic whatever that may be would would have to stop for whatever's on summit road so it's not like there isn't any control we're just falling back to what's known as uh, in the statutes rules of the road fine by me anything from the committee public uh who's bobby yeah so. big agenda Move to recommend the adoption of Ordinance 02023-01. Second. Second. Motion's been made, seconded by Council Workman. Uh, anything further from the committee? Public? Seeing none, all in favor? Boom. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all for coming. I thank the staff for attending, anyone who's home watching. Thank you, and all drive safe. All right. We are adjourned. Yeah,